it's, it's great to see so many people here. I um, also am very grateful to have uh, Heiko and Miriam here who had uh, a while ago, I was at one of their events and I'm very happy to be able to uh, to repay the favor uh, and, and have them here with us today. And um, I, Miriam was very uh, circumspect about Titan ML, but I can tell you they have a phenomenally brilliant team and uh, their inference server is fantastic. Um, they are actually uh, at the moment uh, running some a lot, you know, some of their work on our uh, workstation, the white box, which you see over here, which uh, um, is is something that uh, is, is a collaboration with them. And they've been able to get some amazing numbers on the multi GPU um, inference that uh, I will mention later. But the topic of my talk is self hosting open source and AI harness the power of the hive. And ChatGPT did not write that headline. I wrote it a little bit ago. I got a question about that earlier. Um, I also have a confession to make. I am a lawyer. And this is actually one of my first presentations ever not wearing a suit and tie. So I feel almost completely naked. But um, why? is a lawyer uh, talking to you uh, about tech. Well, um, I happen to have a technical background as well. Uh, back in the 1990s, I had a company uh, where we were building uh, PC hardware. We were networking college dormitories. Uh, then I ran Linux servers uh, at Harvard, also in the 1990s uh, in law school while I was studying. Uh, and um, more recently, I've, I've graduated to running Kubernetes clusters and uh, deploying LLMs on bare metal, like uh, these white boxes here. So I have um, have a little bit of uh, technical street cred, although I am not a developer by training and certainly not an AI or ML engineer. But last year, uh, actually about 18 months ago now, I founded RB City. And uh, we, uh, Tuan already mentioned what we do. We are on a mission to make AI more private, reliable, efficient, and accessible. And we have three products. Uh, we have the AI Zone, an RB City community platform, which was already mentioned. We have the white box, which is the devices you see over there, which is basically AI optimized hardware. Um, you will probably be the most compute efficient per pound machine and the smallest RTX 4090 box you will ever find anywhere in the world. I guarantee you that. Um, so um, that is, and I think it looks cool, but it's a matter of taste. And we also have our advanced retrieval based intelligence, RB, uh, which is AI for private data, which is essentially uh, retrieval augmented generation based uh, AI integration that runs on the white box uh, we will also have it running shortly on our community platform and you'll be able to try it out on our AI zone. So, uh, and I am More, uh, my colleague will also do a live demo of RB uh, in a little bit after I talk. Uh, so I won't uh, discuss it very much. And um, I guess since we are sponsoring uh, today, I feel more shameless about promoting and about talking about what we do, but I, I think, uh, this is a use case which uh, many here would be interested to hear about. Uh, so there we go. Now, why are we excited about AI? All of you are here, not necessarily because you know me or have ever heard of RB City, um, maybe uh, heard of Heiko and Miriam, uh, but uh, there's the wrong narrative here, I think about AI. Oftentimes people say, hey, AI will save you time and it will save you cost and it will improve your productivity. As though we are all these worker drones who just uh, you know, are there to become more productive. And uh, people have fears about losing their jobs to AI. People have fears about you know, uh, well, if I do my work in one hour or maybe somebody else will do it, what is, uh, what am I to be doing with the rest of my time? And 
I think that's, that's a little bit the wrong narrative and the wrong perspective on AI. It's not that AI will necessarily 10X your productivity. And anyone who has spent time playing around as much time with mid-journey as I have knows that AI can also be a huge waste of time. And uh, AI, like the internet and like the mobile phone and like all the other tools we have that were promised to be these huge time savers actually end up sucking up as much of our time as they say. So AI is great, but I think AI is great for a different reason. I think AI is great because it gives you superpowers. AI lets you do things you were never able to do before. And I think you remember the first time you sat down with ChatGPT and you asked questions and you were blown away, or you asked it to code, it coded something, you ran it, then you, it helped you debug it, it explained some concept to you, and you thought, wow, before I could only imagine doing something, and now in five minutes or 10 minutes, I can do it. How many of you have had that feeling? I think that's, that's more than half of the room. And I think that's amazing. I, I had that when, when GPT-4 came out, I was, you know, it can code like a good, decent programmer, which is, you know, really quite amazing. Much better programmer than me. And then the next moment for me, and I think it came even, it was even more powerful. And that came in July of last year when Llama 2 came out and I downloaded the model onto my machine and it worked. It's this, you know, it, it fits on a, on a flash drive, right? It's the world's distilled knowledge on a flash drive. Imagine everything that's ever been on the internet, a lot of private data, everything just compressed, distilled, and you can access it on a piece of memory or like this big, and you need a small device, a PC with some GPUs to access it. And then you hear, you know, you ask a question and you hear the GPU fans spin up and it answers. And then you, you know that it's, well, it's not alive, but, uh, but it's there. It's right there in that box. You control it. You know, no matter what else happens, you've got that. And it, it's, it's like Tony Stark building Jarvis in his basement. You feel empowered. You feel uh, like, you know, again, like you have superpowers. So has anybody had that feeling of self-hosting? I think there were about 10 people. So you know what I'm talking about, right? And this is what we want people to experience. We want people to experience it. We want people to um, start using it. Of course, there are disappointments, right? You start using Langchain for two minutes, it's brilliant. And then it, it crashes and, and breaks down and goes into infinite loops. And uh, okay, maybe the experience isn't as what, you, what it's cracked up to be. But that is not necessarily a failing of the AI. It could be a failing of the prompting. It could be a failing that can be corrected. It could be, uh, you could do things to make AI more reliable. You could uh, make it more accurate. Uh, and that is what I wanted to talk to you about. So this is a tech talk. So we're going to, like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, pull back the curtain and try to see what is behind this curtain. And behind the curtain, lo and behold, um, there are three, at the very abstract level, three components. You have the hardware at the bottom, you have the software, and then you have the model. Now, as a side note, there was a recent UK patent decision that left me scratching my head, which said AI models can be patented because they are not software, they are more hardware. And I was scratching my head at that. I still don't understand. And I, you know, I wrote a, a piece uh, sort of criticizing that decision. But still, you know, AI is not, the models are not exactly like software because oftentimes they're, you know, super self-supervised learning uh, and based on data. So there are some distinctions to be made, but I certainly don't think that they're hardware. So um, let's talk about the hardware first. 
Now, here's a slide which I think is powerful. It also has a picture of my dog at the bottom, if you can see. But um, in 2008, back in the Stone Ages, the first supercomputer to reach one petaflop of compute was called the IBM Roadrunner. It took up an entire floor of a massive data center at a cost of 100 million. Guess what? Six years later, it was decommissioned because it was obsolete. In 2024, you have a cluster of these white boxes that gets you one plus petaflop of compute. In fact, you could argue that a single white box gets you one petaflop of compute because NVIDIA claims that at FPA you can get uh, at F, well, you know, uh, essentially precision uh, of eight bits, you can get 1.4 petaflops out of one NVIDIA 4090 GPU, a single one. So the amount of power, of parallel processing power that we have in these machines is quite astounding. And parallel processing is really, is really the thing that makes AI work, right? GPUs were built for gaming. They're very good at rendering pixels on the screen, but then NVIDIA and others discovered, look, what, what AI models need is a lot of matrix multiplications. You need really, really simple processors, but you need a lot of them. You need tens of thousands, as many as you can get your hands on. And they run these very simple matrix multiplications and they achieve astounding, astounding results through scaling. They're less powerful than a CPU on a per thread basis, but they've got thousands, tens of thousands of threads. So um, that speaks, you know, I, I, the title of my presentation was The Power of the Hive. It could also have been The Power of Parallel Processing, right? You get more done in parallel if you can properly orchestrate it and you, if you can properly uh, make it work together, right? You need an orchestration system. You need some low level software like CUDA uh, from NVIDIA also to, uh, to get it to run efficiently, to get all these separate processes, merge them back together, uh, figure out how to allocate the memory and all of that. And uh, we're not just saying this uh, because we are a member of NVIDIA's AI Startup Accelerator uh, Inception program, because I think Titan ML might be as well. Um, the, uh, but, uh, but we really believe that these NVIDIA GPUs are phenomenal and all of the top GPUs right now, uh, you know, essentially are NVIDIA GPUs. Yes, there are some cloud GPUs, Google TPUs, and there, there are all sorts of projects going on, but, but the type of stack that NVIDIA has, I think is going to be very, very, very difficult for the next few years. To, to rival or to come anywhere close. Now, maybe 10 years, we will see NVIDIA getting uh, really squeezed or pushed. But, but for now, and given how long it takes uh, to manufacture semiconductors and how difficult it is, it's probably the most complicated manufacturing process in the world, um, we're not going to see massive uh, changes. Uh, you know, it, it's going to be hard to beat, you know, the, the four nanometer architecture that they have now with Ada Lovelace and uh, the Hopper GPUs. Uh, it's uh, it's really quite astounding. And also, what they do is they keep unlocking new features and new functionality. They just say, "Look, we've tweaked our drivers, we've tweaked our, our setup, and now the GPU that you bought, you know, last year is actually um, performing much better." And uh, you know, we were actually lucky that we bought a bunch of GPUs last year because now the price for these same GPUs is at least 30% higher because the demand is outstripping supply and it will be outstripping supply for several years at least because there's one company in the world, right? TSMC in Taiwan that you know many people have never heard of, but <laughs> they produce all of the high powered uh, CPUs and GPUs in the world. And if, if China decides to attack Taiwan, then the world is going back to the, the stone ages and uh, at least for, for a decade. <laughs> in computing terms, I think. But um, anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Um, the white box, um, based on RTX 4090 GPU. Uh, this is a post actually from the same Tim Detmers that uh, Miriam showed. Uh, um, not only did he write the uh, bits and bytes library for transformers, he also uh, has done uh, probably the uh, 
um, canonical post on GPU inferences. It's about a year old, but it's still uh, quite valid. And it shows that uh, per dollar, uh, RTX 4090 is just miles, miles ahead of, of a lot of the other GPUs. A100, all the way at the bottom, if you can see. Uh, so actually not, not very efficient. Uh, H100s, uh, depends on which version you have, they're kind of in the middle there. They're really powerful, but you know what? Does anybody know how much an H100 runs these days? So if, if, if you get one for 30,000 pounds, I think you're lucky. You get a good deal. Um, an RTX 4090 runs around two grand. So, um, we have our hardware partners from SCAN here today. Jas, if you wave your hand, and I think Jas will, will vouch that the 4090 GPU is, is, is a hot ticket. That's, that's the one that everybody wants. And actually, that's why we have so many 7 billion parameter models. That's why every model, the 7 billion parameter models are run on 24 uh, gigabytes of VRAM on unquantized. So they just barely fit on, uh, on, on the, this, uh, this amount of VRAM. And of course, if you're quantizing, then you can go a lot higher, as Miriam said already. So um, talked about hardware. Let's talk about open source software. And this is the story of the penguin and the wildebeest, or at least of uh, Dali's impression of a wildebeest. I think it's, it's actually more like a, a ram or a goat of, of some other sort. But um, these represent, for the uninitiated, the, the Linux kernel and the GNU software that forms, GNU software that forms the basis of the Linux operating system. Now, AI runs on Linux, period. You, on Windows, you could install Windows subsystem for Linux uh, and, and run it, but, but really all the serious AI uh, in the world uh, runs on Linux. 99% of the web servers run on Linux. 90 some percent of cloud uh, runs on Linux. Uh, Linux is now uh, standard for, for data centers for uh, high power compute. Now, of course, there would be no Linux without Linus Torvalds, but equally importantly, without Richard Stallman of uh, the Free Software Foundation. Stallman championed this crazy idea of taking copyright law and flipping it around to protect the ability of anyone to see the source code of the computer programs and make improvements for themselves. Now that was the legal innovation um, that really got um, open source software started. And um, I actually have here a book by Richard Stallman with an introduction from my former law school professor, Lawrence Lessig. Um, and uh, this is the, the prize in the drawing uh, or in, not in the drawing in the competition that Tuana announced earlier. It happens to be autographed by Richard Stallman here on the first page, it says happy hacking. So uh, the, uh, most active participant or one of the most active participants on our app will will get this at the end of the evening. Um, now, um, Stallman's legal innovation was actually not very popular until Linus Torvalds came along and had this other crazy idea to invite thousands of developers from around the world to collaborate on the kernel of a new operating system. And that is also the power of the hive and the power of parallel processing. This is how open source software was built. And may, imagine competing with a company that is huge, that has a number of developers that they call, they, they can um, plan, they can, um, they pay huge salaries to, to get the top talent, and yet, a bunch of developers from all around the world collaborating together in a structured fashion can produce uh, better and more efficient and more popular code. 
Uh, that was actually a big question. When I was in law school and I was running Linux servers, everybody was saying, what is Linux? Why would you run something that was created by people who uh, maybe didn't you know, know each other? And how do we know that this is any good? And, and what is all this, right? And now I think the economics have proven themselves. I think the, you know, the everything, the security has proven itself. A lot of these things have, have now proven themselves uh, 25 years later. Now, the LLM stack is mostly open source. As I said, it runs on Linux, stable, lightweight, flexible. Most of the machine learning tools you will see, you know, of course, some of them were built by big companies. We have TensorFlow from Google and we have PyTorch from Meta or then Facebook. Uh, and uh, we have all these Python libraries, very powerful, very transparent, you can go uh, you can pick, mix and match and, and get what you want. And then of course, for deployment, you also have containers. As Miriam said, containers are key. Uh, Kubernetes, Docker, efficient, scalable. Um, and uh, you can spin up as many of them as you want and you don't have to pay a license fee to, for Kubernetes. You don't have to pay a license fee for Docker. You may have to pay a license fee if you're running a, a Windows container. But if you're running a Linux container, don't have to pay anybody and spin up thousands. Now, I already started on this next slide, but why we love containers, modular, and these are not the kind of containers you load on ships, but it's basically the same idea. They're modular, consistent, standard, scalable, fault tolerant. They're not perfect. We have some issues, at least uh, originally, and you know, there were problems with sharing GPUs, if you've got multiple uh, containers running uh, that want access to the same GPU. Now that's a little bit better now. Uh, Kubernetes has some issues uh, by default. It's not configured by default to be very secure. So there are a lot of things you need to do to make it more secure. Uh, there are issues with storage. We now have the separation of compute and storage. Uh, and the storage angle of Kubernetes is sometimes difficult to manage because you have these ephemeral containers that need access to permanent storage. Uh, you have sometimes bandwidth issues. You have these big images, especially for, for, for you know, ML. Uh, you need uh, containers with lots and lots of libraries. You have these giant models. Um, you have a lot of things that uh, eat up a lot of bandwidth uh, and uh, can, can slow you down uh, rather than if you were using, um, for example, uh, something that's outside a container. And for example, we, in our containers that we use, we don't put the model inside the container because it would just be way too inefficient. And if you want to swap out a model, you have to rebuild the container. So we always put our models, for example, outside of our containers uh, and deal with that separately uh, just to keep the size down. And, and I mentioned already the licensing issue. So um, open source. Just uh, one more slide here. What are the advantages for customers? I think that's pretty clear. No vendor lock-in, you control it, you can see it. Um, they say, you know, quality, more eyes uh, makes all bugs shallow or more hands. Uh, you have faster release cycles. You do a, you know, you spot a bug, uh, you do a pull request and uh, it gets fixed, uh, you know, uh, and the cost is often free. I think the, the harder question is this, the harder question is why does it make sense for a company and for developers to release their code as open source? That's the harder question. But I think there are a lot of good answers there too. First of all, you get street cred. If you're just doing very clever programming and it's for an, a closed source project, nobody's ever gonna know about it. Um, and if you're a developer, you want to, uh, you want to publicize your brilliance and in fact, as I understand, uh, I've never gone in for, for an interview as a developer because I'm not one, but I understand the interviewers now look at how many uh, GitHub uh, you know, actions you've taken, how many um, repositories you've contributed to, how much, how much code you've written. Um, they check that stuff out. And uh, you can get global talent, you can get talent from around the world to contribute to your project, to look at your code, to find issues, to maybe fix something, maybe do an add-on to your code. And then if, if it's your 
if it's your code base, you decide, does it go in and does it not go in? If let's say they want something in, you don't want it in, they fork it and they work on their own fork. And you know, that's, uh, that's fine. That's, uh, that's how it should be. Of course, if you release something open source, you immediately have market and mind share because your product is free. People like to, people use it. This is why, you know, Meta released Llama and all of a sudden that became so popular. I mean, Llama wasn't the best model when it was released. Certainly Llama 1 uh, wasn't uh, anywhere close to the best model when it was released, but it started an avalanche. People started downloading it. People started using it. Um, and, and all of a sudden, Meta was like, oh, we just hit a gold mine. Open source is phenomenal. And now we're going to open source uh, all our models in the future. Um, I, I think it wasn't so clear. Obviously, Llama 1 was under a research license. So, um, you know, I think that strategy only developed after they figured, um, look at this. This is really uh, uh, supercharging our, our efforts because we're getting the benefit of all these developers uh, helping us and all these ML teams. Now, um, wait, uh, so this, this slide is a bit um, uh, interesting. Um, we had these huge, huge models being released. GPT-4, we had Anthropic, we had Cohere last year. And, and everybody said, look, open source is never going to be able to keep up. And there was this memo that, that got a lot of play last year around May. Uh, which was allegedly a leaked memo from Google. I don't know if it was leaked so much, but it was done by somebody at Google internally. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Before, before Heiko was there, there I'm sure there are no leaks, uh, uh, no leaks anymore um, from anyone. But um, they run a tight ship. But um, uh, he had, uh, you know, uh, th this person wrote, uh, "We have no moat, and neither does OpenAI." And uh, you know, I, I think. Google has a lot of moats, so I think this is a bit overblown. But um, what does this mean? What does the highlighted bit mean? It says open source. But I'm talking, of course, of open source. Put plainly, they are lapping us. Things we consider major open problems are solved and in people's hands today. So let's go to the next slide. We have these model level optimizations. First of all, we have you know, small, large language models, we call them small LLMs, if that's not a contradiction in terms. Seven to 70 billion is uh, the common size. Um, some of them are now starting to beat GPT 3.5, which is 175 billion. Uh, some of them are coming close to GPT 4. Now, not, a, not in every respect, but in the respects that matter to people for their real life use cases. And that of course includes variants of Llama, that includes Mistral from France, that includes uh, e-models from China, uh, quite a number, quite a number of, of really phenomenal models. Uh, you know, Yi, by the way, has 200,000 context window. Mistral, I think, has 32,000. So they've got, they've got pretty, they've gotten pretty good in terms of the context window size. They've gotten pretty, uh, pretty powerful for various things. You've got, uh, some specialized models, some coding models, which are getting pretty good. So um, yes, open source is behind uh, GPT-4, but uh, I think Miriam has a bet going that, that we'll see a model of GPT-4 uh, quality this year. And I think we'll see it probably in the first half of this year, maybe. Uh, things are moving very quickly. Uh, quantizations, uh, quantization, uh, Miriam already, talked about this. Um, anybody who has seen Ant-Man knows you get smaller, faster, but a lot weirder sometimes. Um, uh, a, I would say a little bit lossy, uh, not too much. So you, you quantize something about four times, about a factor of four, and uh, you know we have bits and bytes, you have GPTQ, you have AWQ, you have, you have others. Um, we like GPTQ, by the way. Uh, but uh, Mar you know, Miriam's team likes AWQ, fine. Um, everybody has their own preferences, but uh, the point is these are really um, phenomenal, uh, phenomenal uh, tools. And, and this is probably your first go-to step. If you're going to run a model locally, quantize it, see how well it works uh, because you can run a much bigger model and um, 
you know, and, and actually the, the, the big thing here, the big trick is memory bandwidth. So on a, for example, 24 gigabyte GPU, um, you are running models of from 7 billion uh, and a 7 billion model isn't very efficient on that kind of GPU in terms of the memory bandwidth. Um, but a quantized model on that GPU will, because it's so compressed, you can get a lot more through um, that, you know, through that, you know, memory uh, bandwidth, and it will perform better. It will uh, really is is sort of at the sweet spot, I would say, uh, for these GPUs. Now, you also have latest thing, or maybe not the latest thing, one of the latest things, a uh, mixture of experts models, GPT-4 is known to be now a mixture of experts model. It's not just one model, it's actually several models put together. Uh, and then at the time you're inferencing or sending an inference request, it only uses some of these experts uh, and it determines which of these experts to uh, trigger for any particular request. So that makes it faster, that makes it smarter, but it also makes it bigger. Uh, the, the size of the model is bigger uh, compared to, uh, you know, the the smart uh, sort of the, the number of uh, activations that happen for for each request. So um, we've now found out that we can self-host. Why would you want to? Miriam, I think already went in into that. I'm not going to. Uh, repeat what she's saying. I think uh, all the points she made were good. Confidentiality, there's compliance, there's control, there's cost, um, there's customization, possibility to customize it. Uh, there are capabilities, often a low latency, real-time uses, offline uses, so you can take the white box somewhere where there's no internet access, and as long as you've pre-downloaded the models onto it, you can work. Uh, you can work completely offline, you can work in a secure location, uh, you can work in a, in a, in a classified setting because you know, nothing is leaving uh, material. And then finally, of course, it's also fun and you will learn a lot when you do it. Privacy, I want to mention just briefly. Um, LLMs or any AI models, they thrive on data, right? You need to give them some information to get information. And uh, typically you have this is roughly how an interaction goes. You have a user input, you have an AI model response. Maybe you supplement the user input with some uh, retrieval augmented generation, some additional context from a database. Maybe it's a company database. Maybe it's your own database. Model gives you a response back. Now, important thing to understand is the model is not at this point training on your data. It's not learning anything. It's a, it's a stateless model. It doesn't have any memory. It just processes your response, gives something back to you. It doesn't retain inside the model itself. It doesn't retain anything. So that's good for privacy, right? That means you can potentially devise a regime that will um, protect your data and not uh, expose it unduly. But of course, what does everyone do? Everybody wants your data. Everybody logs your data either to improve the quality of their service or for training future models or to make money or to sell to third parties. So the logging typically happens. It's optional, but it almost always happens when you're on a cloud-based platform. And uh, then of course, you can also have fine tuning. You can have um, other uh, techniques such as RLHF uh, that use uh, the user's input and, and the model's responses and to fine tune or to train future models. Uh, so, what happens, the question about this is, can the model provider access and use your data? And your data is there at every single step of the way. So all five of these steps include somewhere, either your data is being directly sent or your data is being processed and a response is being given based on your data. So this is a question you should ask. You should look at the terms of service for any cloud-based platform, um, or of course you can self-host because that uh, then obviates the need to uh, be concerned because your data is not leaving anywhere. It's it's staying right there. Um, and, oh, sorry, there's a typo on this slide, but uh, 
uh, between server and the edge. This is where um, I think there is a space. The servers provide power and scalability. The edge provides privacy and portability. And the device that we have, the white box, is very much in between there, right? Sometimes people have called it fog computing. I don't like that term because it sounds like there's a lot of confusion, but the idea is you take the cloud and you bring a little piece of it down and uh, it becomes sort of like a hub uh, for, uh, for data intensive applications. You don't always want to be sending everything all the way up to the cloud. Maybe you want to process it locally within your enterprise. Maybe you want to process it uh, in your office on your machine and you get versatility, you get efficiency. Um, I call it workstation for the edge or wedge. And it's shaped like a wedge, so there you go. Um, now, what are the problems of self-hosting? You have GPU availability and costs. You have insufficient in-house expertise. It's hard to test something before you actually invest in buying a whole bunch of data center GPUs. And of course, it's hard to keep up the latest advances once you've deployed something, then the new model comes out next week and you're like, oh my God, I've spent all this time, I've deployed something, I've tested it, but now I wanna try this new model and I have to start from scratch again. So um, all, of this are, all of these are challenges, all of these are things that we think we can help with. Um, I'm not gonna go through, go through the details and I, I'm gonna skip over some of these uh, next few slides uh, fairly quickly. But we have a white box performance, and I want to show you. This is actually based uh, the top row here. The unquantized models, seven billion parameter runs. You can get up to seven hundred tokens a second, and we know this because Titan have done it on our uh, white box, and they've published the benchmarks on their blog. So uh, up to seven hundred tokens a second with batching, uh, and. Uh, They've done it, I think, with Llama 2, but I suppose the results from Mistral are going to be quite similar. And then you have, you know, the dual GPU with a, the bigger machine that you see over there. Uh, you can do 14 billion parameter. And then, of course, when you quantize it, you supercharge it even further. Uh, I don't have exact uh, benchmarks yet. Maybe guys at Titan can, can help us with that. But uh, uh, 34 billion parameter quantized, you can run that. 72 billion parameter you can run on the dual RTX 4090. Um, and then you can also run a quantized mixture of experts model like Mixtral, which is I think now probably the most in demand model. I think people are using Mixtral these days for, uh, for a lot of different use cases. Uh, and, and that is memory serves around 49, um, somewhere around 49 billion parameters total. It's not exactly seven times 8 billion, but uh, it also has a 32 context window, which is, is very nice. Uh, inference costs versus the cloud. I think this is a toss up uh, for LLMs. There are some very uh, uh, low cost providers out there for APIs, for, uh, for things like Llama. Uh, I think Together AI, and there are a few few others that, that provide fairly low cost, but uh, but it is actually um, it is actually a fair bit cheaper than GPT three point five, uh, depending again on the efficiency and how good your your inference uh, pipeline and server is. Uh, and uh, for for something like Whisper, uh, Whisper uh, is a free uh, text uh, sorry speech to text model by OpenAI, and uh, they have API at uh, somewhere around six cents, uh, no, sorry, 0 0.006 cents a second of video, and I think I calculated that comes to about $36 for 100 hours of video transcription. You can do that at 1% of the cost locally. So with the, using the latest flash attention. And we've, we're not gonna have time for a demo, but we could, we could demo that for you today if we had more time. Um, white box use cases, uh, what we're looking at is uh, use them as developer boxes. Uh, you can use them for inference. You can also use them for performance efficient fine tuning. You can do LoRa, QLoRa, SLoRa, whatever LoRa you want. 
Um, you can use it for demo, proof of concept, pilots, and uh, you can also use it for production, either a single box. We also have them working together and uh, in a Kubernetes cluster. So um, quite, uh, uh, quite easy to set up, uh, gives you low latency, scalability, um, and security. And uh, also the power of the hive in parallel process again. Uh, finally, my last topic, uh, LLM uses and reliability issues. So you have a bunch of business uses for these models. You have uses like getting information and insights. You can evaluate, you can classify, you can create content, hence generative AI. Uh, you have transformations, you have summarizations, translations. Uh, all of these suffer from reliability issues. You have the fact that LLMs don't have the relevant knowledge that you actually need to give the answer. Uh, they have a tendency to hallucinate. They are unable to provide you with references to what they're saying because they're just statistical models, essentially. Uh, and they lack consistency. One input you get one day is going to be different from the input you get another day, even if you're uh, going to the same API endpoints. Now, what are the mitigations that you can use? So there are sort of three classes. Um, there maybe there are others, but one is just prompt optimization, and hence the term, you know, prompt engineering and new uh, alleged uh, skill set. Um, this is better, basically providing the LLM with better directions, better at extracting the information that's that's there. You have retrieval augmented generation, which is what I wanna focus, focus on. And that is about giving the LLM a source of ground truth that it can then efficiently get, you know, give answers based on that ground truth. And then you have finally, you have fine tuning, which is essentially uh, giving your LLM new skills or, or maybe tuning it to your preferences of what you would like. I mean, fine tuning can be used for lots of purposes, but this is one of the things that distinguishes it from, from RAG. Um, now, uh, what is our approach? So we, we are building this autonomous retrieval-based intelligence system that uh, my colleague Aimura is going to, to demo shortly, but um, um, it works with the material in your file and can be self-hosted, but it can also run in, in the cloud if you wanted to. Uh, hopefully in a, in a private environment. Um, we'll just skip the next couple of slides. Uh, be, you can see them. This is uh, how how it works. It you know user connects to a web app. They can do it either through a white box directly. We have a uh, our own VPN server that you know uh, handles the request. Uh, connects to the white box, or if you have your white box locally, connects through your VPN. Then uh, you can go through RB City potentially. Then you have the typical RAG pipeline, user uploads a file, uh, it gets OCR'd uh, or uh, indexed and audio video may get transcribed. And then you have um, the files. The one thing that we do differently from others is we actually encrypt everything and we encrypt it with a user key that you supply that's saved in your browser. It never goes to us. So we, never, we can never decrypt your data we can never see what's in your data. Uh, it's all completely encrypted and uh, there is no way. Uh, so, and we not only do we encrypt the files that are being uploaded, we actually encrypt, and I'm always gonna show you, we actually encrypt the information in the vector database at all as, as well. So, uh, so then user submits a request and uh, you get answers with citations. And then you can go and download a PDF with those citations and with the highlighting showing you where in that document it was basing the information that you were getting, that, that, that it based the answer on. So um, final point here, this is my most technical slide and I'm not going to uh, talk through it uh, in, in great detail because of lack of time, but what, what is the retrieval based pipeline? You can look at it different ways, but you have a loading, you load, so you have an indexing pipeline first when you're loading the documents, then you have a query pipeline when you're doing uh, you know, the inferencing and the user is interacting. 
Uh, and each of these steps, each of these steps in the way, there are color-coded steps. Each of these, you can just do so many different things. I've listed about 25 different things you could do, and there are probably another 25. I just saw a post from one of uh, Heiko's former colleagues at, at AWS who posted you know, a similar chart, but it had different things on it. And yes, you can have you can have loads and loads of things, and we can spend an hour on each one of these. And we can talk about, uh, you know, things like hierarchical indexing, uh, you know, that, that uh, Llama index does. We can talk about semantic chunking, which, which uh, we do, for example, in, in our system. We can talk about uh, hypothetical embeddings, which is also a very effective technique. Uh, and we can talk about uh, all sorts of different uh, tooling to make the reliability of your LLM better. All of these take time, all of these need testing and the, put it here in the corner, test, test, test. That's how you know whether it's getting better and uh, what is actually working for you. And uh, is it really worth spending your time on you know, changing the embedding model? Is that gonna move the needle for you? Or are you better off spending your time on one of these other points, which actually is gonna give you much, much better results. So, um, Power of parallel processing, we want to harness it as well. Uh, we welcome AI developers and open source collaborators to come talk to us. Uh, we have GPUs and we are open to work. Uh, so we can collaborate together. If you have a project that you're working on that's open source, um, we can help you um, with some resources to, to get you, if you need uh, you know, access to GPUs. We can help uh, also potentially build something into um, our product, which we're planning to open source as soon as the code is uh, um, in a way that uh, that we can. We're, we're you know happy to uh, share it, and uh, we are looking for companies to do pilots with us, to do partnerships, to do customizations. Uh, we are looking for tech enthusiasts to beta test our, our products uh, on our platform or, or elsewhere. And of course, you know, investors are always good as well. Although we're not, we don't go to VCs and we also do the power of, of small scale uh, investing at the investment level, so it's, it's part of our philosophy. So, um, so anyway, this is us and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Aimore, but first I will take a um, couple of questions um, about, about what I said. I know that was a lot and uh, I went pretty fast. Thank you. Sorry, there, there's one in the back. Um, so my question is about the alleged skill set. So um, I have to do research around um, AI augmenting people skills like problem solving, creativity, communication, and empathy. Um, and I'm just struggling to find um, any white papers. Like the research is pretty meager. And I just was wondering if you have any ideas um, where I can go to find people to talk to, maybe um, something to read, like anything really. Um, I, I don't know the answer, I'm afraid, but um, maybe somebody else in this room does. And uh, if you post it as a question on our platform, then maybe somebody will respond and uh, we'll, uh, you'll get the answer you want. Thank you. That's exactly what we are trying to build on our com community platform. You can share your knowledge, know-hows, everything. And I would like to remind you that all the presentations are available on the platform as well. Um, there were more hands up here uh, in the front. So the question is about multimodal LLMs or yes. something like Lava. Have you got any experience in them? And I, I guess that also applies to Titan ML. W what sort of uh, features does that provide to facilitate fine tuning of uh, something like Lava? Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to give Miriam a chance to answer that. We, we haven't done that much just because for lawyers, the most LLMs tend to be the most important use case. Uh, there's not as much need for multimodal, but uh, I think in due course, you know, LLMs will all become LMMs, and uh, we, we we just won't even talk about different modalities as as, as different models potentially. But uh, but for now, 
you know, uh, you can. I mean, you can use the same hardware. You can use the same software stack uh, to run these uh, to run these and self host host these if you want. Um, in terms of developing models, and and that that's not my area of expertise. But uh, Mary maybe has something works. to say. Um, this is actually super timely because we were playing with Lava on our Arby box uh, last week. Um, so yeah, so we we have worked with multi -mo multimodal models like Lava. In fact, we're actually just starting to support them in the takeoff server, so we're expanding like multimodally. Um, but where I think it's really helpful in RAG, which you uh, talked really well about, is quite often when you're doing retrieval over documents, and probably not the case in law, but we found with a lot of the documents we're trying to do RAG over, there are images and diagrams and tables which are very difficult to pass. Um, and quite often these multi -mo multimodal models like Lava do a better job of interpreting these images or parts of the section um, than just, just a plain text model. Um, so yes, we have, and I'm super happy to chat about it after if you're interested. There's a question over there. And I think we, we're, we're gonna move on after this question. Yeah, uh, firstly, congratulations on having a physical product. Uh, yeah, I think it's the first meetup I've been to when someone's actually had something in the room. So congratulations, and it looks awesome as well. Really nice. Um, that encryption step in the RAG, that sounded pretty cool. Uh, I haven't kind of heard of that as a step. What was that? That sounds pretty sophisticated and like a secret source to what you're offering. Well, why don't I I'll let Imora talk about that when he does the demo, because okay. he will actually show you um, what, what that looks like. But uh, but yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we focus on in privacy and, uh, um, you know, as I said, user key encryption uh, is, is what we use. Um, okay, so um, I um, we have one um, short live uh, demo that we're going to try to do. Uh, I'm already if you're if you're ready to come up here, and we also have of course Heiko's presentation afterwards. So please please stick around. Uh, we are uh, open. We we're not going to kick you out uh, of here, and there will be some champagne at the end to celebrate the launching of our AI zone. So or Prosecco rather. Um, um, so, um, so please stick around. Hello. Hi. Can you all hear me well there? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dimitri. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope like, uh, you know, to do a demo here to kind of um, put everything that these folks have said uh, and, and bring all this to life. Um, yeah, I'm a, my name is Aymore. I'm a machine learning engineer working in this app uh, called Arby. So first of all, I'm here in my terminal. I'm just gonna bring uh, MV top, which will monitor the GPU uh, in the machine. It's running right there on that machine right there. Yeah, the small one. So we'll see that once I start the code with uh, Docker Compose up, sorry. Uh, you see that there will be like four services uh, you being created. And one of them is the app itself. The other one is the LLM service. The other one is the embedder. And the fourth one is the a vector database. Uh, we can see there in the right hand side that there's like a peak of memory being you know used. So the models, the embedder and the large language model are being loaded into the memory, the memory of the GPU. Um, and now if I go to the app, um, refresh this. You can all see the app right there. I understand that the, some of the, you know, like the letters here will be small, but I will, you know, uh, speak loud what it what is saying. So first of all, we have like a welcoming message, a place where you can drag and drop uh, files. At the bottom here, we have like a user uh, input for text and questions. 
on the left hand side on the panel here, the, the, the side panel, we have a place where the user can put their access key, uh, which also works the same way as, you know, like a username and the password. Uh, it's just like, it's kind of like easier to have just one token created. Uh, some instructions on how to use a conversation history, like a threads, and also like an uploaded file stable. You will see uh, this being populated soon. Now, why don't we start with, uh, you know, like a simple example uh, asking, uh, who are you? And once we ask that, the assistant answer, I am an AI language named RB Assistant created by RB City to provide help for information or international arbitration. I'm designed to be intelligent, detailed, and well-structured in my response, but I'm also humble and only provide information that I'm absolutely sure of. So as you can see, it provides an answer to our question and it shows its purpose as well. Uh, why we don't we, you know, complicate a bit more? Like, let's ask like, uh, who uh, is Dimitri? And it said, uh, the assistant answers, I'm sorry, but the passage provider does not mention anyone named. Please let me know the passage or context in which the name appears and I'll do my best to provide more information. So it's good because, you know, we, we don't want our model like hallucinating or making, uh, being overconfident and saying things that are not sure about. Um, but we can also fix that by providing some context with documents. So what I'm gonna do right now is to upload a document and it's actually like uh, Dimitri CV. Uh, and when I hit this button here, everything that um, Marilyn and Dimitri said about, you know, the document being um, parsed, chunked, vectorized, and the vectors stored in the database will happen. So this is all gonna happen like in like the behind the scenes. And you see it's quite quick. And it also generates like this key for us here, which, you know, I, I as a user, I'm the only person who has this key. Uh, and I'm on the only person who will be able to kind of unlock my documents and uh, conversations as well. Like in the future, we'll plan to do that. But as you can see, the document was uploaded here, the name of the document, and it has like five pages. Uh, just, yeah, one fact that in that machine, if we are embedding, like doing this process of uploading a document, the whole Shakespeare pieces, it contains 3,000 pages. It runs less than a minute. So it's pretty fast. Like imagine like all that Shakespeare has produced, one minute, it's there. Like at your, you know, access at your fingertips. Um, so now let's ask the same question. Uh, who is Dimitri? But Uh, ask the same question, but now the model will have access to the CV or like the document that we have uploaded. And the answer is Dimitri is an individual with multiple nationalities, including American, Russian, and British. He's highly recommend arbitrator and arbitration council with over two decades of experience in investment treaty and commercial disputes. I guess it doesn't contain like the tech side of things, right? Like yet the, the CV, but uh, it looks like the Dimitri I know. And uh, we can see here, like why the model now answers this. There are like the passages that the model use to, you know, to base its answer. So because you can see here, like there is like first passage happens also like in page five, the second passage happens in page one and they are not like sorted by page. They're actually sorted by relevance. You know, like how, how useful is this? piece here to actually answer the question. Um, and we also have like a feature that converts answer into PDF. Let's take a look into that. So so this, it produced generates like a PDF with uh, some headings, like a disclaimer, but four main contents about everything that you care about, like the question and the answer that you they will provide it. Uh, it has like the query, the answer, the passages, and also like the documents or the, in this case here, 
you know, like Dimitri CV. So you can see that there is a, you know, like the highlights. And if we click, for example, you know, like passage five, it will take you directly to where that, you know, it's being sourced, like that, that reference of that passage. Now, um, so how is this like kind of like possible? So some of, I want to show now that, uh, oh yeah, uh, some of this uh, tech stack that we use to build uh, this app were based into Infinity, uh, which is like an embedding uh, inference server. Uh, it's a high throughput, like low latency REST API for serving vector embeddings. We also use like TaxGen, which is um, or also called like as Uba. Uh, here's like a tool or framework that allows you to load uh, and serve large language models. And it has a nice UI as well. And finally, uh, let me, uh, the vector database. Um, so here we have uh, the collections. So the collections you can imagine is each collection is like a user that uploads X many uh, documents there. And as you can see, they're all encrypted. That like, looks like a gibberish here, but it's because they are encrypted. So this will be like the name of the collection. Also like the page content that be, everything has been like encrypted as well as like the metadata. So for example, uh, document name, uh, the document key uh, and so on. Um, I also would like to, yeah, to show here that in this specific collection, there are like 534 vectors. It is depends of course, like how many chunks, you know, like the parameters that you set in the chunking uh, uh, process and how many, the size of your document. Uh, and there's also like a nice visualization here that if we run this, it will you know, plot this, you know, hyperdimension vector into two, two dimensions and you'll be able to kind of, uh, you know, uh, hover around and see each point of this is like a vector which represents a passage, right? So if there were not encryption here, you'll be able, for example, if you're doing like some experimentation, you'll be able to see how good is your embedder. Uh, yeah, and you can maybe drive insights if you would like to about these documents that being embedded. Uh, I know this was like a quick demo, uh, but yeah, I would like to thank everyone who came here today. Uh, it's amazing to see so many people uh, interested in this stuff. And yeah, any questions? Um, thank you for the demo. I have a quick question. Uh, what happens if you ask the same question again? Is it going to generate exactly the same output like it did? Yeah, so uh, these models, they are generative models. And how they work is they're producing like token after the token, and it's probabilistic. So one of the parameters that you can set that change this variability of response is the temperature. So the lower the temperature, the more repeatable the answer will be. Um, you could almost set that to zero uh, and that you will get more consistent response. However, uh, it, empirically, it's, um, you can see that the, the quality also degrades. So it's also good to give you know, a bit of creativity per se or variability in the, in the large language model. All right, thanks. I think there was a question here. Yeah, here. Uh, my question was, how accessible then are these um, uh, models available for people who are looking to develop their own uh, AIs? And are the other collections some way, even though they're all encrypted, are you able to sort of encompass them into sort of like grander, bigger models? All right, so uh, yeah, to answer your first question that all these tools that I've showed, they are free, they are open source. So, and you know, like uh, they actually can show like the exact name, sorry? Oh, you can't, you don't download the model here. Yeah, in the Uber, for example, 
you can uh, select, so for example, the one that we are using is the bloke Zephyr 7, B, 7 billion beta. Uh, there are a couple of others here. Most of them are like in hugging face. So it's, yeah, pretty much available. Um, and what was your second question is how do you have another question? Sorry, did, did, did I answer your first question? You, you did, yeah, 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 you covered it. Yeah, and literally how accessible, so they're completely accessible in terms of their, their open source. Do we have to provide the computing power or is that all on a back end? And is there any sort of what the cost is for that? Roughly? So all those four services that I just ran here, I spun up, they're running that little machine there. Yeah. It's, it's right there. Like there is no kind of like cloud. That That's kind of like the cloud, maybe like the, or the wedge as you will refer to. Yeah. Someone here. So as RB City, did you build this tool for like uh, lawyers, solicitors uh, to assist them in their casework um, so they can upload documents in a secure environment and uh, help them work on cases much faster? Uh, yes, that, that's the idea. Certainly we are aiming to um, target the the legal market that's the market that you know i know i was a partner in a firm for for 12 years and uh here in the city and uh, so that's that's the target market that i know i mean the tool at this point is more generic but of course we will uh, be adapting it to to different requirements as uh, as they come one well, follow-up question which other sectors or industries do you think a white box like this would be like a good suit for other than the legal sector like that you could identify if that's okay to share? So uh, actually a lot. I was just talking to somebody today who was interested in it for, for fintech applications and uh, anytime you need really to uh, where your data can't leave your premises, right? So we're saying we bring AI to your data rather than you sending your data to the AI. So, uh, so that that could be any any context uh, from kind of you know government use of you know uh, confidential materials to lawyers to finance to to you on your computer saying, look, I don't want my data to be going the cloud going in the cloud. I just want you know I don't want to upload my emails somewhere. I would rather just. Uh, have a search through my emails locally uh, here. Thank you. Uh, there are a few, a couple more. I think we'll, we probably can take one or, one more, maybe one or two. Thank you, by the way, this is really great. Do you think, how do you think this is going to affect employment of lawyers? Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are a few lawyers in the room, uh, but not not that many. Uh, I think it will affect um, the quality of the work and it will improve the quality of the work. I actually don't think that it will make less legal work because let's say you're a lawyer, previously you found one relevant document, this is gonna help you find 10 relevant documents. You could potentially spend 10 times more time you know, writing about those. Uh, maybe LLM is going to help you with some drafting, but in the end of the day, you're not necessarily spending less time, but you're you're ending up with a much better product. So for us, it's not so much about uh, saying, uh, as I started out in the beginning, saying it's not about just 10xing your productivity. And no law firm, uh, if we go to a, to them and say we're going to 10x your productivity most law firms are going to say, well, that means I have to fire 90% of my lawyers and that's, I'm not going to, not going to make any money. So, cause we bill by the hour. Uh, so, so it doesn't work <laughs> as a use case. So, so we focus not on time savings or cost savings, but in uh, leaving no stone unturned and, and giving you the most powerful tools to, um, to win your case. If you're a disputes lawyer. Uh, maybe Thank you. There was one Um, just coming back to the companies who you work with, does it mean for each company you need one white box or is that just run centrally, especially for smaller firms? And uh, my understanding is the open source uh, code is open, yeah, the op open source code is essentially for free. 
but you can only use it in combination with the white white box, right? Um, no, actually, uh, first of all, you can use it other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, you you can run it on on any. If you've got GPUs that can handle it, absolutely, you can run it on those GPUs. Um, open source doesn't mean free, by the way. Just throwing that out there. Uh, open source. Uh, you can still charge for for open source software, um, and you can still, uh, you know, and certainly we plan to offer all kinds of services around um, the customizations, and and we know our code base, and uh, hopefully we can we can add value. But uh, but we are building on top of an open source stack, and uh, it uh, you know it, you know I think I think the. Um, uh, what was your what was your other question? Sorry. Um, uh, whether each company then needs a white box oh, to yes. run it properly. Uh, or? So uh, we generally would think yes, each company would would want either a white box, uh, either for a long term or temporarily. Uh, maybe they decide to buy their own GPUs later, but uh, maybe they want this for a month or two months, and that's what we do. We we typically don't sell these at least for now. We plan to rent them out on a monthly basis, so you can uh, try them out. Um, see if you like them, see if they're working for you, and then uh, we we lease them as a package. So uh, so that is that is the current model. Uh, obviously, we might expand to offer uh, cloud-based APIs, or you know we we might we offer it on our platform for um, a premium subscription. But uh, but that's not that doesn't distinguish us from everyone else to the extent that we have. Uh, cost advantages or uh, domain specific advantages we might but uh, but you can find a thousand uh, cloud hosted api service providers if, if that's what you want thank you thanks thanks for the talk um yeah so my question's around i don't know if you know anything about sort of trusted execution environments so tees um no, like AWS have like AWS Nitro and these environments, environments where, uh, you know, you run your code, but not even the cloud provider can actually access the underlying, like the underlying thing that's running inside the, the virtual machine, even the hypervisor is not even accessible. So I was wondering how does your product, which from my understanding is a product where the customer sort of runs, you know, the, the, the data doesn't get shared to the cloud provider, the data kind of sits inside this white box that you have kind of that you kind of sell. How does how do you distinguish your product from let's say trusted uh, execution environments uh, where these are actually on big cloud providers like AWS and and so on? If that makes so sense. I, I, I'm not an expert on AWS. We have an expert here <laughs> sitting next to me, uh, so I can't answer that question. I what, what I do know is that we're very interested in trusted execution environments, and and for for those who don't know, so there is. You know, encryption in transit, encryption at rest, but then uh, trusted execution environment is really encryption during use. And that's what you're talking about. So you're talking about encrypting memory, you're talking about isolating the uh, processes from the host so that the host doesn't see them. And there are a number of algorithms, uh, CV and, you know, various other, uh, you know, Intel and AMD have their own different, uh, different uh, execution environments. And we, we are looking into it. Uh, for example, there's something called Kata containers and confidential containers, uh, which allows you to run those in, um, uh, you know, in, in a Kubernetes environment uh, seamlessly. Um, what I have found personally is that it's not quite ready for prime time with respect to GPUs. NVIDIA is working hard on it. Microsoft's working hard on it. I'm sure others are working hard on it. So uh, they're, they're making advances every day. But as far as uh, and there's a there's a project out of Berkeley, uh, they have a team working on it. Uh, I think it's coming along, but I, I just we're not quite there yet in terms of us experimenting with it. And I think the product isn't quite there yet. But I think it will be. I think give it a give it a year or two, uh, we will see that being uh, more more available. And of course, we we'd love to we'd love to use it if it uh, comes to fruition. Kata is open source. Uh, and all these projects are going to be open sourced, I believe. Okay, thanks. Thank you. 
I, Linklater's had a little study. They didn't publish their methodology, but it was interesting. It came out after GPT-4 um, had some new press about it passing the bar exam. They ran a lot of questions against UK law, GPT-4, this is, and it was appalling, right? Just nowhere, you know, with the obvious implication being that GPT-4 has got bar exam questions in its training set. You know, when you think about using small models in particular in the legal industry in the UK, for example, or Europe, you know, how important do you think fine tuning is actually going to be? Because it strikes me that it is going to be important. We need to embed knowledge of uh, the specifics of UK law into models, perhaps with uh, continuous pre-training as well, and then building, uh, you know, expert models on top of that. Thank you. It's a very interesting question. Uh, personally, I don't think that fine tuning is the way to go here. I think retrieval augmented generation is the way to go because you don't necessarily want to bake in something into your model uh, in, a, in a statistical probabilistic way. You want some very concrete case citations. You don't want to take the average of five cases and get a citation. Even if it's UK law based, you still want the actual case and you still want the actual correct citation. So fine tuning, I think, won't get you there all the way. Uh, plus the law changes. So one difference between medicine and law, for example, medicine, you can have symptoms that, you know, you can diagnose all over the world. They're going to be the same. With law, you've got, you know, 100 different legal systems. They all change. Uh, there's always different applicable law, different applicable facts. So I, you know, if you're going to fine tune, you're going to have to fine tune a thousand different models in a thousand different jurisdictions. And um, maybe that's going to happen, but I... I don't see it happening anytime soon in any, any reliable way. So, but RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, best solution uh, because you can actually refer to actual cases. You can actually refer to, you can actually say, His, this is the applicable law, these are the statutes, and it'll bring, bring it back to you with citations that as a lawyer, you will always want to verify anyway. You're not gonna just rely on some LLM telling you, oh, this is the law, you have to be able to drill down and explain to the judge or to the client exactly what document you are citing when you say that. So thank you very much. And um, I will turn it now over to Heiko for his very exciting talk.